Welcome to Learn and Love Music. I'm Dwayne Hulbert. Today we have a special treat. We have Dr. Jeffrey Block, who is from the University of Puget Sound, one of my colleagues. Today, Dr. Block is going to be talking about Beethoven. He is an authority on Beethoven, and as you might have remembered from before, an uh, expert on Schubert as well. But Beethoven is our subject today. Dr. Block has written a book on Beethoven. It's called Experiencing Beethoven. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about four pages from <laughs> this book, uh, which is a book about how to listen to Beethoven. That's the idea behind the book. It's from a, a part of a series called uh, A Listener's Companion Series. In this book, um, I talk about eight Beethoven piano sonatas and uh, a couple of his concertos, but I also talk about a little piece a trifle, which uh, in French is called a bagatelle, and in German a kleining chiton, a little, a little thing. Um, and there's a genre of music called a bagatelle, and these are small piano pieces. And the most famous of all these small piano pieces is also one of the most famous pieces that Beethoven ever wrote. It's called Für Elisa, Für Elisa, which is German for for. Elise, and we'll get into who Elise is and all that. But in the, to set up everything, I thought I would start by talking about how these little pieces fit in in Beethoven's career. Beethoven began his career as a piano virtuoso and then as a composer. And he, uh, we think of him as one of the things that stands out about his history is that he gradually became deaf, but he actually was a professional performer for a surprising long, surprisingly long time. It wasn't until he was in his 40s that he stopped performing, but he just didn't do concert performing once he, the onset of deafness. So he was a virtuoso, one of the greatest, he was born in Bonn, in Ger Bonn, Germany, and he moved when he was 21. He moved to the big city, the Big Apple. No, I was going to say New York, <laughs> but no, it was actually Vienna. Yeah. And uh, within the next few years, uh, he started publishing piano sonatas. He actually wrote three piano sonatas when he was uh, 11 years old, but they weren't published. But he started publishing sonatas, performing his concertos, and drafting little pieces which eventually would be called bagatelles. Some of the bagatelles turned out to be movements of the piano sonata, but some didn't. So, most of the, he, all, all together, he wrote 32 piano sonatas, and that's what he focused on throughout his career. But most of those piano sonatas, two-thirds of them, were composed by the time he was only about 22 years old. So, that, those are, so the, the pieces like the Pathétique, the Moonlight, the Tempest, with those names that everybody knows, those were all composed early in his life. And over the next 20 years, he only wrote 10 more sonatas, Waldstein, Passionata. And then much later in his life, he wrote five final sonatas. So he was born in 1770. He came to Vienna in 1792. He'd finished... Uh, two-thirds of his sonatas by 18.3, and between 18.16 and 18.21, he wrote five final sonatas. He also wrote one big set of piano variations called the Diabelli. Why, why this all ties in, well, in the next segment, we'll talk about why this all ties in. But he also started writing and revisiting some small pieces, which were called the Bagatelles. What I found interesting is that I played, over the years, I probably have played, um, of the 30 sonatas, maybe at, you know, 16 or 18 of them in concert or in, in performances. And um, why had I, have I never played any of the bagatelles? Yeah, are they that uncommon or unpopular? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, they're... they're People think because they're small, they're not really good. I mean, <laughs> in the, in the word bagatelle means trifle. I mean, it's, it's something inconsequential. So, but they are really underrated pieces. He, he ended up writing uh, three sets of bagatelles altogether. Uh, the first in 1803, 
uh, that's with six bagatelles. Mm -hmm. And those are just really a lot of fun. And then, uh, but then he didn't publish any more bagatelles until 1821. So uh, that, that's one reason. So they were not the pieces that, they weren't performed in concerts mm -hmm. and they just were small, smaller pieces. I guess that's the only the way I could say it. But they, they did play for Elise, <laughs> uh, we'll get it, which we'll get into in a minute. So, so uh, the first group has six bagatelles and they average about three minutes each. That's the average for those. And then in 1821, in 1823, in two sets, he wrote another 11 and those are about one to two minutes each. So those are really, really small. And, but meanwhile, what happened was uh, while, while he was writing these smaller pieces, um, he had another 14 smaller bagatelles that he was hoping to fit into these collections and they didn't fit in. And that's where for Elise comes into things. He, he, he wrote it and he revised it, but it just didn't fit in with uh, any of the sets that he was publishing. And he got so, it, he spent a lot of time doing this, working on these little pieces. Mm -hmm. And what he ended up doing, he said, forget that. He probably said something <laughs> stronger, but uh, it's easier to write a new, completely new set of bagatelles. And he wrote a final set of Opus 126, which in 1824, which ended up being his last piano work. It's after he's done with all 32 sonatas. And a lot of people play those. And those are a little bit bigger. Uh, those average over four minutes. It's a, it, you put, if you play them together, it's sort of a big piece. Uh, and those are completely written from scratch. So uh, one thing about that big set of Diabelli variations I mentioned, 33 variations, that's his biggest piece. But the biggest piece he wrote for piano is comprised of 33 small pieces called variations. And some of those variations are a lot like bagatelles. You know, I find it interesting too when I read through some of these bagatelles, I wanted them to sound like the sonatas, but they weren't because one of the things I noticed, large leaps going downward, yeah. like octaves, and then long rests. Yeah. And then stop and start and stop and start. I always thought of the Beethoven sonatas as having this sort of forward motion. But these have almost a jagged feel to them. Right, because they're, self, they're little self-contained pieces. The reason why in the bigger pieces he needed that momentum to keep it going over a longer period. And that's one of the things that Beethoven accomplished as a composer is adding how to make a piece bigger. Mm -hmm. by keeping, by having things unresolved that you could want to keep the motion going. Right. And um, so, but these little pieces are, he, he can, can, he could, uh, in a compact way, do everything he did in a big piece, but just in a little tiny piece. As I mentioned earlier, while Beethoven was finishing his final sonata, piano sonata, and writing uh, one, another set of these small bagatelles. He also was writing a really large work, his largest piano work he ever wrote called the Diabelli Variations, which is 33 variations on the theme by the publisher, Diabelli. And you're gonna now hear the first half of the theme. And one of the variations takes a little part of this theme variation 13 and makes a little bagatelle of it. I mean, it's part of a larger piece, so it wasn't meant to be um, a piece called a bagatelle, but that's what it is in terms of its character. It's a variation based on the theme, and for now we'll call it the bagate a bagatelle. And the ideas in that bagatelle, variation 13, is actually remarkably similar to one of the bagatelles from the original set, Opus 33, that he composed 20 years earlier. And now Duane's gonna play the bagatelle number 13, the first half of that, very quick. And then he's going to play the opening of the earlier bagatelle. And you'll all notice that the rhythm and the harmony is really quite similar. This bagatelle, one of the things I hadn't mentioned about the bagatelle, is that they can often be extremely humorous. The 13 second bagatelle that Duane plays from Opus 119 is a really great example. 
uh, it goes by lickety split and it's like a whole piece and it's over in 13 seconds minimalism but uh, the bagatelle the second bagatelle from opus 33 uses this rhythm in a humorous way and you'll notice it because Dwayne will play the beginning of it and then at the end and you'll see how Beethoven completely tries to confuse the listener with this rhythm that was so straightforward when it began. So it's a really funny piece. So that's a great example. Beethoven, we think of him as a real serious, scowly-faced guy, but he was hysterically funny, his music. And one of the third, the third movement of his big multi-movement pieces are called scherzo, which actually means joke. And there's an enormous amount of wit. Um, so there's one piece that he wrote in a piano part to a song called The Flea, uh, based on a, a poem by, uh, by Goethe. And uh, what he does in the fingering, he has the pianist kill the flea uh, at the end with the thumb. I mean, he's very clear about that. And he used to like to play this for friends, at that, you know, he was a party guy, he played these for friends, and uh, it's just, his music is, can be really, really funny. So let's listen to the theme by Diabelli. We'll do the theme first, and then we'll listen to the variations. Here's the theme. <laughs> Now listen to the harmonies that Beethoven put into this variation, using the A minor and the G major and some of these different keys. Here's variation 13 that Beethoven wrote based on the Diabelli variation. Here it is, A minor, G major, it's a line of rhythm. Major. It's a little more sophisticated than what Diabelli did, but Beethoven used Diabelli's theme as a foundation for it. Here's a bagatelle from Opus 33 of Beethoven, and notice how he uses humor in this piece. The second set of bagatelles, I said it was 1821 and 1823. How did that happen? Well, how did that happen is that Be uh, Beethoven wrote what are now, uh, now, now the set has 11 bagatelles, 1 through 11. And he wrote 7 through 11 first, and he published those first. And those are new, new bagatelles. And then he went back to his early life in Vienna and figured out that he could use five others to introduce before he went to the uh, number seven. So he wrote five, uh, he reworked five early bagatelles. And then so the, well, the one problem he had left is how do you get from the early ones to the later ones? So he wrote a brand new transition bagatelle, which is now number six. And they were published in two different sets. Now they're together in one set. They don't really belong, but they're there as one set. So, so that's um, Opus 119. And Dwayne's going to perform 
uh, as an example, he's going to play a couple of examples from Opus 119, these little bagatelles. He's going to play number three, which was sketched in back 119, Opus 119, number three, which was sketched in 1802. And then he's going to play the earliest sketched one from 1794, which is number four. And then he's going to play one of the new ones, which is number 10. And what's fascinating about number 10 is that you've got to be quick because it lasts 13 seconds. It's the <laughs> shortest piano piece that Beethoven ever wrote. Uh, it's 12 measures and 13 seconds, and it's just a really charming bagatelle. So that's how small I get. And now Dwayne is going to play three excerpts from the bagatelle set Opus 119. Uh, the first is number three, which was sketched in 182. This is a piece that he published in 1823, but he sketched this in 1802. Uh, and, and then he's going to play a number five, which was sketched in 1794, when he was still in his early 20s. So it's uh, a real early piece that he reworked for Opus 119. And then finally, he's going to play one of the new ones, number 10, the second to the last of the set, which is the one that's 12 measures long and 13 seconds. The whole piece, the shortest piece that Beethoven wrote ever. He must have wanted it to be fast because I timed my, that at my speed and I could only get it to 14 or 15 seconds. Uh -huh. So I'll have, I'll have to practice that. <laughs> so here's number three from Opus 119 by Beethoven. He sketched it in 1802. Here's what it sounds like. It's in the key of D major. number five in this set of bagatelles. It's in the key of C minor. And one more example from Opus 119. This is the number 10 and it is known as the shortest piece that Beethoven ever composed. It only lasts about 13 seconds, but it has a wonderful character to it, lots of fun. Here's what it sounds like, Allegramente. <laughs> So then he had to go, what am I going to do with these 13, 14 bagatelles that, I, that obviously don't belong in Opus 33? That was published 20 years ago. They don't fit in Opus 119. I've got all the ones I need. I'm going to start a whole new group of six. So I have 13, 14. That's where Fur Elise fits in. Fur Elise was one of these abandoned bagatelles. From, that was abandoned from about 1808, 1810. And what happened was, after he wrote this little bagatelle, he gave it to his girlfriend. I say the world girlfriend, not, it's really she wasn't his girlfriend, but he still wanted to marry her anyway. <laughs> but there were a lot of unattainable women. She was 22, 22 years younger, so big deal. So, so he gave, he gave uh, Therese Malfatti, this piece that's called Fur Elise. So why is it called Fur Elise? Well, that was a, a pet name for her. her. Her name was really Therese, but Elise is the pet name. And she kept this piece uh, until she died. And she died in 1851. Beethoven gave her um, the early version of this piece. From eight, I'll just say 1810. From 1810, he gave her this early version. 
So that's what she died with, was this early version. And what happened after that was uh, a, a, a Beethoven scholar named Ludwig Noll, N-O-L-H, uh, copied the autograph and then lost it, which is good. Right, I mean, not because it's not good, but he lost it. And he made some mistakes in copying it as well and published it in a book in 1867. And if you've ever played for Elise, and probably a lot of you out of there have played it, that's the version you play, the 1867 version. With all, but the, the, 1860, the 1867 version misread um, one note, one key note that appears all the time in the 1810 version. So that's not a, an addition, that's the original. And then Beethoven made a number of other changes uh, in 1822 that never got published. Nobody published them until 1991, something like that. And so if you've played this piece, you've played the 1867 version, wrong notes and all, and wrong, you know, I say wrong, and that the early, early notes, well, wrong, one wrong note and some early versions that Beethoven eventually changed, but never himself published. He always saw his revisions as improvements. So um, the problem is that the public for over 100 years now has only, only gotten to know the earlier version. And so that's sort of baked in. But the later version, I think particularly with the accompaniment, is, is actually more interesting. So I'd like to go over the, the two most audible changes. But I should say first, uh, the piece as a whole, the form of the piece is called a rondo. I mean, that's a very common form in the classic period. Uh, it's, it, it's a piece that has a lot of repeated A sections and B sections. And so it's a, a simple, usually a, a tune. It's not complicated. It's like something that's tuneful, singable. It's often used at the end of a concerto or the end of a sonata because it's so accessible and so tuneful. So it's a rondo. And it, it's characterized by a lot of returning to the main theme, mm -hmm. it, exactly as it was even. So that's the form of the piece. And so when we look at some of the changes, so what happened in 1822? What did he do differently in 1822? In 1822, he decided to change uh, the left-hand accompaniment. And instead of beginning on the downbeat every time, da-da-da, 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 he began with a rest, 16th note rest, and then played the 3 16th notes after that. So it went da-da-da, 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 da-da-da. And in the manuscript, you can see, I mean, that, you probably can't see it, but if you, if you had it right in front of you and you were staring at it, you could see that he, in a, you know, if you knew it was 1822, he added... The, those 16th rests really large in a different kind of a pen so that everybody could see them. And that really sounds different. Everyone in the, everybody watching this will notice uh, that change. And you'll also notice the note change, which was not really a change from a E to a, uh, from a D to an E. Uh, that's original from 1810, but the accompaniment is a new change from 1822. The other changes are audible, but you might not notice them if you're just listening to the piece and you, you've heard the piece before and all that. You may not notice it, but I just want to mention what they are. If you're if you, you know, really listening carefully and you listen right. to it a few times and maybe you'll get it. Um, so, between, so the piece goes A, B, A, and then C. I mean, so there's an ABA section and then a C section. Before the C, which is new material, Beethoven in 1822 added four new bars, four new measures. So that's one change. Mm -hmm. Brand new. Okay. Brand new, four, four new transition measures. And then um, after he got to the D section, before he got to the E section, he repeated ABA again w without repeating it. So that's, he's just 
making the piece a little bit bigger by, you know, making, by repeating the ABA. Then, um, right before the final A, he took a measure off. Now, that's a hard one to remember, you know, to think. He, he, he took out a measure, removed a measure. And then, two measures before, he said, one measure before the end of the piece, he added a measure. And that's it. Those are the only things that he did. But, so that when I said the most audible thing is what he did in the A section by the note that um, he originally had, he restored, was taken away by Noel, and the biggest single audible thing is this accompaniment. So it doesn't add up to a huge amount. So if you play the original version, that's still, you know, still fine. But that's what he did in 1822. Now we're going to look at the two versions of Fur Elise, and it has to do with one note that's in measure 7. So right near the end you heard this. So the notes are E, C, B, A. Now the Barry Cooper version uses a D instead of an E in measure 7. Let me play it for you. So that D is a little bit different than what we're used to hearing. Another point with the Barry Cooper version is the accompaniment. When we look at the original Breitkopf version, all of the accompaniment notes, or most of them, come on the downbeat of each measure. So, downbeat, and downbeat with the bass, downbeat with the bass, downbeat with the bass, downbeat with the bass, downbeat with the bass. With the bass. Listen to the Barry Cooper version of it. It's a little different. Off beat, off beat, off beat. And here's some other changes. Here are the four new measures that Beethoven put in in 1822. Also notice in measure 27 where there's a little more decoration than the original for release. Here's what it sounds like. It's an F major. It almost sounds like Beethoven was improvising a little bit in this passage. And just as a reference, this is what the original one sounds like. It's a little bit more simple. And finally, let's look at the ending. Some subtle changes here as well. You'll notice that some of the inside voices are a little bit different. Uh, in the earlier version, this is what you, we hear. C. In comparison, the 1822 version sounds like this. And also listen to the left hand as well. Certainly there are some changes there that we're not used to, but I think both of those versions are viable. You're now going to hear Professor Holbert play the final version of for release that Beethoven revised in 1822, but never got published until 1791. In preparation for this talk, I listened to a lot of pianists play uh, uh, for release, and every single one of them plays the 1810 version. If you want to hear for release before today, uh, the best way to do it is to buy the, you can purchase the score and play it yourself. Uh, for this, the, uh, it was published by 
uh, the Beethoven scholar Barry, Barry Cooper, or you could uh, put it on your computer on MIDI and it'll play it for you in a sort of a tinny version. Or, and now you can hear Professor Holbert play it. Now I can't say this is the absolute first time this has ever been performed by a human, but it's one of them. Maybe one of the few. One of the few, and it's a real treat. And all the bagatelles are a treat. If you, uh, if you, I know I was going to say, if you don't have the time to hear a sonata, go listen to Bagatelle. They're, they're absolutely the most underrated little trifles or Kleinig chitin uh, imaginable. They're charming, they're adventurous, there are many worlds, all in two, three, maybe four minutes, or maybe even thir 13 seconds. <laughs> Well, we want to thank uh, Dr. Block for joining us on Learn and Love Music. We hope to Thanks have you back me. again Thanks for sometime with another subject. So we'll see you next time on Learn and Love Music. I'm Dwayne Hulbert.